Welcome to NVC Life. I'm Rochelle Lamb, veteran NVC trainer and relationship coach, helping listeners navigate interpersonal conflict and ground more deeply into relational living. Greetings, fellow humans. Today, I explore modern culture's obsession with comfort, including its relatives, ease, convenience, and efficiency. You've probably heard the phrase, getting comfortable with discomfort, which, of course, if you really think about it, only maintains the obsession with comfort. In the context of nonviolent communication, ease and comfort almost always end up on the needs list that I ask people to generate in my trainings and workshops. So it would be fair to say that comfort is so ubiquitous that we consider it a need, a necessity, an essential that we can't do without. So I'd like to explore the need we so often claim to have in the modern world for comfort, ease, convenience, and efficiency. I'm going to read a passage from the book, The Continuum Concept, Allowing Human Nature to Work Successfully, written by Jean Leloff. This is one of my all-time favorite books, and some listeners might recall that I've made reference to it in an earlier episode. I consider myself blessed to have discovered this book in 1987 while I was pregnant with my first child. It hugely influenced me and continues to do so to this day. During the 1950s and 60s, Jean Leadloff made a series of expeditions to the Venezuelan rainforest and spent several years living with the Yaquana people. Her book, which is based on informal observations while living with these people, was first published in 1974 as the continuum concept. A biography written about Jean Leadloff titled Jungle Jean says this, Jean's insight and original thinking moved readers across the globe, including John Lennon, who found in her book deeply comforting home truths. With a global following and zealous readership, the continuum concept has been a quiet bestseller that has been translated into 20 languages and is now headed for its 18th printing in English. Countless parents the world over have said words to the effect of, When I read The Continuum Concept, I threw all the other parenting manuals away. To me, Leadloff's book is probably the one book on my overcrowded bookshelf that I would refuse to part with. It's that important. Okay, so I'm reading from chapter one here, how my ideas were so radically changed. Jean has already spent time in the Amazon. She's traveled there with two Italian men who will be referenced in the piece that I'm about to read. As I read this, please consider the idea of comfort, where you inherited your ideas about it, how it directs your thinking, your biases, your choices. Okay, so consider that. Here goes. After seven and a half months, I had a far more detailed view of the jungle's rightness. I had seen the Torapan Indians Not just the two we had hired, but whole clans, families at home in their huts, traveling in groups, hunting, living the life of a species in its habitat, without outside support of any consequence except for the machete and the steel axe in place of their original stone one. They were the happiest people I had seen anywhere, but I hardly noticed it then. They were so different from us, smaller, less muscular, yet able to carry heavier loads much greater distances than the best of us. I did not so much as wonder why. They thought in other patterns. To get to Paracapa, one of us would ask, shall we go upriver by canoe or march overland? And an Indian would answer, yes. I seldom had a clear sense that they were of the same species as ourselves, though of course, if asked, I should have said so without hesitation. The children were uniformly well-behaved, never fought, were never punished, always obeyed happily and instantly. The deprecation, boys will be boys, did not apply to them, but I never asked myself why. There was no doubt in my mind that the jungle was right, nor that whatever I was looking for was best looked for there, but the rightness and viability of the jungle's ecosystem, plants, animals, Indians, and all, did not, as I first believed, 
automatically constitute an answer, a personal solution for me. Again, this was not then clear. I was slightly ashamed of my increasing desire for spinach, orange juice, rest. I had a wildly romantic love and awe of the great uncaring forest, and while preparing to leave was already thinking of ways and means to come back. The truth of the matter was that I had found no rightness for myself at all. I had only seen it from outside and managed to recognize it, and very superficially at that. I somehow did not see the obvious, that the Indians, as humans like myself and also as participants in the jungle's rightness, were the common denominator, the link between the harmony around me and my want of it. Some small illuminations did get through to my civilization-blinded mind. For example, some concerning the concept of work. We had traded our slightly too small aluminum canoe for a much too big dugout. In this vessel carved from a single tree, 17 Indians at one time traveled with us. With all their baggage added to ours and everyone aboard, the vast canoe still looked rather empty. Portaging it, this time with only four or five Indians to help, over half a mile of boulders beside a large waterfall, was depressing to contemplate. It meant placing logs across the path of the canoe and hauling it inch by inch in the merciless sun, slipping inevitably into the crevices between the boulders whenever the canoe pivoted out of control, and scraping one's shins, ankles, and whatever else one landed on against the granite. We had done the portage before with the small canoe, and the two Italians and I, knowing what lay ahead, spent several days dreading the hard work and pain. On the day we arrived at Arapuchi Falls, we were primed to suffer and started off grim-faced and hating every moment to drag the thing over the rocks. When it swung sideways, so heavy was the rogue dugout. It several times pinned one of us to the burning rock until the others could move it off. A quarter of the way across, all ankles were bleeding. Partly by way of begging off for a minute, I jumped up on a high rock to photograph the scene. From my vantage point and momentary disinvolvement, I noticed a most interesting fact. Here before me were several men engaged in a single task. Two, The Italians were tense, frowning, losing their tempers at everything and cursing nonstop in the distinctive manner of the Tuscan. The rest, Indians, were having a fine time. They were laughing at the unwieldiness of the canoe, making a game of the battle, relaxed between pushes, laughing at their own scrapes and especially amused when the canoe, as it wobbled forward, pinned one, then another, underneath it. The fellow held bare-backed against the scorching granite when he could breathe again, invariably laughed the loudest, enjoying his relief. All were doing the same work. All were experiencing strain and pain. There was no difference in our situations except that we had been conditioned by our culture to believe that such a combination of circumstances constituted an unquestionable low on the scale of well-being and were quite unaware that we had any option in the matter. The Indians, on the other hand, equally unconscious of making a choice, were in a particularly merry state of mind, reveling in the camaraderie, and of course they had had no long built-up dread to mar the preceding days. Each forward move was for them a little victory. As I finished photographing and rejoined the team, I opted out of the civilized choice and enjoyed quite genuinely, the rest of the portage. Even the barks and bruises I sustained were reduced with remarkable ease to nothing more significant than what they indeed were. Small hurts, which would soon heal, and which required neither an unpleasant emotional reaction such as anger, self-pity, or resentment, nor anxiety at how many more there might be before the end of the haul. On the contrary, I found myself appreciative of my excellently designed body, which would patch itself up with no instructions or decisions from me. But soon, my sense of emancipation gave way to the tyranny of habit, to the great weight of cultural conditioning that only a sustained conscious effort can countermand. 
I did not make the necessary effort and therefore came away from the expedition without much profit from the revelation. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this passage so eye-opening, so important, so revealing in the context of how our modern world views life. And I'd like to return to the questions I raised at the beginning of this episode. Where did you inherit your ideas about comfort? How does the strong need for comfort, ease, convenience, direct your thinking, your biases, your choices? And this question, how does our modern obsession with comfort impact our capacity to be human? I mean, to really be human and to belong to a place and to live in accord with life itself. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for tuning into NBC Life. For future episodes, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. For free resources or to book a private session with me, head over to rochellelam.com. Until the next time, stay sane, grateful, and generous. Thank you.